If you've been following this channel for a while, you know that I usually do quite long form content. Videos that last for an hour, maybe two hours. They take weeks to months to research and even longer to film and edit. So I'm going to do something slightly different today to make sure that I get more than one video a year out for you guys. But it's not going to be like that. I have done no research for this video. I will cite no sources and I will not accept constructive criticism from any of you. This isn't going to be valuable history. There's no academic virtue to what I'm doing here. We're just going to be having fun. We're going to be talking about the Roman Empire and the enemies that they faced. And we're going to be ranking them in one of these tier lists. I got this idea yesterday from a Reddit post to give you the idea of the kind of video this is going to be. We're going to be going through many of the most well-known enemies of Rome. People who, whilst building and maintaining their empire, the Romans came into contact with and didn't like. And we're going to be ranking how dangerous they were to the Romans, how well they resisted Roman encroachment into their own lands, and kind of the general vibe. You know, how barbaric and scary they were. How much of an impact they had on the Roman psyche. How much the Romans were paranoid about them perhaps attacking one day. Um, how much the Romans feared them, basically. So let's start strong with a classic. The Gauls. The Gauls are one of the kind of OG enemies of Rome, along with the Samnites and the various other Italian peoples. And they lived in northwestern Europe primarily a fairly large area that encompasses a good deal of tribes. If this was a more in-depth video, I'd talk about the different kinds of Gauls. The long-haired Gauls in the north and the short-haired Gauls in the south. The Italian Gauls and the... But it's not that kind of video, so we've just got Gauls. Now, the Gauls were pretty scary to the Romans, especially in their early days. Imagine you're just a small city-state halfway down the Italian peninsula. There's a few thousand of you. You've got this good thing going. You call it the Republic. You've only just started, but everyone's getting used to it. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, thousands of barbaric warriors who you do not recognize appear from the hills and burn your city down. That's what happened to the Romans in 387 BCE. A huge army of Sinones, a tribe of Gauls, popped down into Italy and burnt their city. In order to get the Gauls to go away, the Romans just promised to give them all of their money. This is a pretty effective strategy throughout history. You can pay people to fuck off. It's often a good deal easier than, you know, fighting them. And the Romans decided to go with this strategy. So they came up with an agreed weight of treasure that they'd give off to the Gauls to try and get them to just leave them alone. But whilst they're weighing the treasure, the Romans turn to the Gauls and they accuse them of tampering with the weights to try and get more out of the Romans than they agreed with. In response to this, the king of the Gauls, a guy called Brennus, takes off his armour and sword and throws it onto the Gallic side of the weight and says, Woe to the vanquished! Which is a pretty scary line. You know, it's very real politique. The Gauls were like, well, we've won, you know, we, we get to decide the amount of treasure we extract from you. If you like, we can just burn down the whole city and then you'll have nothing left. So already we think they're going to score fairly highly because sacking Rome, that's not lightweight work. Very few have managed that. And we also have to give the Gauls an extra few points for their winged hats. Those are pretty cool. But we can't ignore the fact that, to be honest, it was a bit of a one-sided rivalry between the Romans and the Gauls. The Romans made pretty short work of them on most occasions, especially in a fair fight. And eventually, in the first century BCE, Julius Caesar, in an attempt to score himself some political points and make lots of money, invaded Gaul and subjugated it in several years of pretty bloody war. Now, the Gauls put up a good fight. You know, they even got together and united under a guy called Vercingetorix. And they gave Julius Caesar a real run for his money. But there's no getting around the fact that Caesar beat them pretty decisively. So I'm going to put them right in the middle, in the C tier. I'm not going to act like the Romans didn't have to break a sweat to get rid of the Gauls, but they did manage it. I would have stuck them a tier or two above if Asterix and Obelix were real, but to the regret of all historians, they're sadly not. Also, did you guys know there's a full Asterix and Obelix land in France? Like, they've got a theme park dedicated to Asterix and Obelix. If Asterix and Obelix had existed, S tier, but they're fictional, so C tier. Let's move on. Next, we have the Carthaginians. 
The Carthaginians had a huge maritime Mediterranean empire way back in the early days of Rome. When the two civilizations first met, Carthage was the bigger, badder, scarier of the two. For about a century and a half, the Romans fought three wars against the Carthaginians, and these were massive conflicts, like some of the largest wars in history. They went on for decades, and they were proper death struggles. Generations grew up knowing nothing but this massive conflict between these two cities. To win the first Punic War, the Romans had to build their first ever navy. And they lost it, it was destroyed. In fact, they lost loads and loads of navies, over and over and over again. It was a hard-fought war, but they did win in the end. Just for the first Punic War on its own, I put Carthage in like the B tier, let's say. Yeah, I'd go with like B tier. But the Second Punic War is just... Well, to give you some backstory, I was a dinosaur kid. You know, one of those neurodivergent toddlers who got really into dinosaurs, learned all of their scientific names, and watched Walking with Dinosaurs, the BBC documentary, and Jurassic Park on repeat. But when I was about eight years old, I transitioned into a fascination with human history, a transition facilitated by the cover of a book that I saw in school with a Viking on it. I saw this really, really cool Viking warrior with a round shield, a sword, and this scary looking helmet, and I thought that, that will be my new obsession. So you can imagine my excitement when one day when watching, I think it was like BBC One or one of the standard issue channels that existed back then, this was back in the early 2000s, watching TV hadn't yet been supplanted by the internet as the main thing that kids did. And a documentary came on about Hannibal Barker. I watched the first part of this documentary and I learned about this general who came from a city called Carthage in North Africa who took an army from Spain that included elephants, marched them across the Alps into Italy and in three battles defeated the Romans. At Trebia, he defeated a consular army that was larger than his. At Lake Tresemine, he defeated another consular army. And at the Battle of Cannae, he surrounded a Roman army nearly twice the size of his own and destroyed it. I thought that this was just epic. In school, instead of doing my work, I would draw out a little diagram of how the Battle of Cannae went and imagined myself as the great general coordinating the battle and winning this victory. And I remember thinking, this Hannibal guy is the coolest person who's ever lived. I really hope things work out for him. But Hannibal, like all Carthaginians, underestimated the Romans. Not their army. He knew how to defeat Roman armies. He underestimated the Roman people. That they wouldn't surrender. The way that wars usually work, like most of the time, is two different peoples go at it for a little while until one of them is so damaged and demoralized and things have gone so badly for them that they decide to call it quits. And then they negotiate something for a peace where the side that often came off better gets a bit more stuff and the war's over. That's peace. The Romans didn't do this. They didn't do negotiated pieces. They didn't do negotiations or armistices. They accepted surrenders. That was the only way that wars ended for them. What Hannibal and the Carthaginians never got is that you have to kick the Romans whilst they're down. It's a good policy to kick people whilst they're down because it might not seem very nice, but if you don't kick them whilst they're down, they might get up and kick you. And then you might kick back, but they'll still be kicking you, and they might kick you so much that you can't kick anymore. Then you're being kicked. You might still be able to punch, but a punch doesn't have the same range or power as a kick. And in, in a game of kicking, which wars often are, I think, uh, this analogy has gotten away from me, but Hannibal should have kicked the Romans whilst they were down. Instead, he kicked back and waited for a surrender, which never came because the Romans weren't going to surrender. You know, he figured, oh, I've destroyed your army. I've ravaged the Italian countryside. You guys aren't going to bounce back from this. Let's just negotiate a surrender now. But the Romans were full-blown like, no, that's fine. You might have destroyed most of our male population. But we'll just give it 10 years and a whole new generation of soldiers will be raised up. And then we'll fight you again. And they did. And they won. And that was the Second Punic War. The Third Punic War is honestly just sad. 
Like Carthage knew that it had lost, it had given up its empire, Rome ruled the Mediterranean, everything was chill, and they just wanted a quiet life, you know? Like, and, but the Romans wouldn't let them. There was this guy called Cato who finished every speech by saying, Carthago de lenda est, Carthage must be destroyed. And eventually the Romans decide to, well, kick the Carthaginians whilst they're down. The Roman general Scipio Aemilianus rolled in, laid siege to Carthage, and destroyed it. A probably untrue later story says that he sowed the earth with salt to make sure that nothing grew in memory of Carthage. So the Carthaginians were utterly wiped out. When I found out about this, I was actually angry. Like, on behalf of the Carthaginians. They just wanted to be left alone, man. Like, what's all this about? I thought about how sad it must be for Hannibal in the afterlife, looking down and seeing that all his hard work came to nothing. The guy lost an eye for this war, you know, like, at the very least let his city carry on. They'd already taken their empire from them, like they're not a threat anymore. I'm getting carried away. Carthage is going into the A tier, and most of the heavy lifting for that is done by Hannibal Barker. Um, he was unsuccessful in the end, but I can't ignore the fact that he is perhaps the greatest enemy that Rome ever had. For our next group, I'm going to go with the Hellenistic Kingdoms or the successor kingdoms, the Diodoche, whatever you want to call them. This refers to a series of kingdoms that existed in Greece and the Near East after the death of Alexander the Great. Bit of backstory, Alexander the Great was this Greek king who very quickly conquered the Persian Empire, bits of India, and basically made this great big, very impressive looking empire, and then died. And when he died, the whole thing just crumbled to pieces into a number of successor states all of which are very cool. It's a period in ancient history that I find especially fascinating. But there's no getting around the fact that, and this makes me incredibly sad, that when it came to defending themselves against the expanding power of Rome, they were kind of pathetic. You know, they did not put up much of a fight at all. There were like three Macedonian wars where the Romans rolled into Greece and made short work of Alexander the Great's army. Uh, not his army, but the army that was descended from his army. And it was, it's honestly depressing to watch them get slapped around so easily by the legions. In 146 BCE, the same year that Carthage was destroyed, Corinth was sacked. And after that, Greece is a part of the empire. There's no going back from here. Mithridates VI of Pontus did his absolute best to resist Rome. And if anyone could, it probably would have been him. Um, I did a whole video on that, and he got thoroughly pummeled. He did his best, and boy, he did not give up. Um, but the Romans made pretty short work of him. The Seleucid kings, they put up a fight. They even hired Hannibal Barker to come and fight for them and teach them how to do it. No good. The Romans conquered them. The last of them to survive was Ptolemaic Egypt. That was the final Hellenistic kingdom. And, you know, I love Ptolemaic Egypt. I think it's such a fascinating culture. It's got everything to get me personally excited about an ancient civilization. It's got religious and cultural blending. You know, the Macedonians and Greeks came over and blended with the Egyptians. So you get gods like Serapis, who's a mix of Egyptian and Greek deities, and things like that. You get the monumental architecture and the unique imagery of Ptolemaic Egypt. And you get incest, lots and lots of incest. All of this is honestly all I need personally from an ancient civilization. But the Egyptians, the, the only way that they could survive the rise of Rome was to try and cuddle up with the Romans, to give the Romans what they wanted and hope that the Romans would be generous enough to let them keep what they already had. And Cleopatra was great at this. You know, she got very close with Julius Caesar, used his help to, well, very, very close with Julius Caesar, she used his help to drive away her brother and become the sole monarch of Egypt. And, you know, Cleopatra's iconic with a capital I. No matter what depiction you see when you see Cleopatra, and most of it is made up after the fact anyway, so who knows how accurate it is, there's no denying that she's a titan of a historical figure. But she, she really did back the wrong horse with Mark Antony. In reality, Ptolemaic Egypt fell as a result of it picking the wrong side in a Roman civil war. And yeah, that, it, it fell pretty quickly and pretty totally. And that was the end of the legacy of Alexander's empire. It was an enormous and 
historically important empire that was built on the back of military dominance. And by the time the Romans rolled around, they honestly couldn't stop them. I don't know what happened between the death of Alexander and the arrival of the Romans in the region in the 2nd century BCE, but it made those successor kingdoms weak as shit because they just straight up could not stop the Romans. The Hellenistic kingdoms that succeeded Alexander the Great's empire? D tier. And honestly, that's pretty generous. I think they only score that highly because of how inconvenient it was for the Romans to have to conquer that much territory in such a short period of time. Our next group is the Parthians. The Parthians were exceptionally dangerous to the Romans for one key reason. They had access to the secret weapon of pre-gunpowder warfare. The thing that no one could counter. The Parthians had guys on horses with bows and arrows. And this was to the massive detriment of the Romans. In the first century BCE, a fellow called Marcus Licinius Crassus decided he would have a pop at conquering the Parthians. And this made sense. He wanted to score some credibility for himself. You know, his fellow politician, Julius Caesar, had got a lot of good PR out of conquering the Gauls. And this was a period in history when the Romans were really blowing through their neighbours. No one could stand up to the Roman legions. So he took his army and he marched into the Syrian desert to conquer the Parthians. And a much smaller Parthian army appeared on the horizon and spent the next few days shooting his big Roman army full of arrows. And whenever the Romans tried to get close to them, they would ride further away, shooting arrows as they went. There was nothing the Romans could do. You know, you couldn't catch them to go into hand-to-hand -hand combat because they were faster than the Romans on their horses. But you couldn't fight them at range because they had longer range bows and were more skilled at using them. The Romans just had to sit there and be shot, which sounds miserable. Eventually they captured Marcus Licinius Crassus and they poured molten gold down his throat, which, you know, these things happen. So the Parthians, kind of from the beginning of their relationship with the Romans, are a big threatening force. During the Battle of Carrhae, they wiped the Roman army out. They even capture the imperial eagle things that the Roman legions carried with them. This was a serious deal. If a legion's eagle was captured, that basically means no one got out. That was the Emperor Augustus, a generation or two later, would even have to go through this whole peace negotiation with the Parthians to get the eagles back from them. And he was so proud of this achievement of this, and this isn't a military victory over the Parthians, this is just negotiating the return of some metal birds. He's so proud of this that he sticks it on his breastplate and wears that breastplate for, I guess, when he posed for the Prima Porta. This is the most famous statue of Augustus. It's in the Vatican Museum now, I think. This is our image of the emperor. And the thing that takes center stage, the thing that he puts in the middle of his own torso to show off to the world, is that time that he got some eagles back from the Parthians. Gives you an idea of the reputation they had in the minds of the Romans. For the first century BCE and the first century CE, the Parthians really are the biggest rival to Rome. They're the only empire that borders on the Romans. But let's not overhype them. Although the Parthians were the biggest threat to Rome for a period of time, it was by no means a balanced rivalry. Rome was the bigger empire. Rome had the bigger armies. Rome had more wealth and more social organization and stability, to be frank. The Parthians ruled their empire as a minority of foreign elites. Elites who were always warring with each other. They couldn't really seriously threaten Rome very often because they were too busy fighting one another all of the time. Parthia was an unstable empire. And to be honest, by the second century CE, when the Roman Empire is at its height, the border with Parthia kind of just becomes a training ground for the Roman legions. Trajan, the emperor in the early second century, actually conquered Mesopotamia off of them. A bit later on, Lucius Verus, who was the co-emperor to Marcus Aurelius, also went and sacked the Parthian cities. And Septimius Severus, when he'd wrapped up his civil war, kind of did a quick tour by Parthia to sack a couple of their cities and win some easy victories, because it's bad Roman PR to have gone on campaign and only fought other Romans. 
So after winning his big civil war, he figured he better beat the Parthians up a little bit, just to remind everyone that he wasn't only fighting his fellow countrymen. And this is kind of the position that the Parthians occupied in the second century. They were too weak to seriously resist Rome anymore. Ro the Romans probably couldn't conquer them, but in wars with Rome, the Romans always won, and they always got to sack Parthian cities. So I'm going to stick the Parthians in the B tier. They were effective at resisting Rome, and they were the biggest thorn in the Roman side for a long time, but they weakened over time. You know, they got worse and worse. Our next people to be enemies of Rome uh, is a broad category of Germanic tribes. People who lived in this region from the 1st century BCE until about the 2nd century CE. And the reason I'm talking about this period in particular is because there is a reason that the Romans never conquered this bit. They wanted to, under the Emperor Augustus, you know. Augustus was the great nephew of Julius Caesar, although he was also his adopted son, so Caesar was like his dad, and Caesar had conquered Gaul. Augustus thought to himself, okay, how do I move on from there? I conquer Germania. So he sent the legions in. And this bit around here, he put under the command of a guy called Quintilius Varus. Um, who was this nasty governor fella. And Varus was in charge of subjugating and pacifying the local Germanic tribes. And he did this, as the Romans often did, by making allies of some of them. One of his key allies was a fella called Arminius. Arminius was of Germanic origin. He'd been taken from one of these tribes when he was young, raised amongst the Romans, and was now in the Roman army as an auxiliary. What the Romans didn't know is that he was secretly working for his own people. Arminius set a trap for the Romans. He produced false reports of like a rebellion going on deep in the forests of Germania, and he got Varus to march his legions th through the Teutoburg Forest, a dense, thick woodland where the Germanic warriors could divide the legions up and cut them into pieces. And this is like resisting imperial power 101. You bring them into unfamiliar territory. You play into their sense of overconfidence and into their superiority complex. And when their soldiers, who are lethal most of the time, are in a position where they're not capable of fighting back to their full capacity, you fall on them with everything you've got and teach the Romans back home the cost of keeping this territory. Sure, you can invade us if you like and you'll probably win but you're going to lose a lot of people in the meantime. Now, I honestly love this, partly because I love an underdog. The Germanic tribes were this disparate group of disunited peoples who banded together to face off an imperial threat that came to take their way of life from them. I like that. That's a sympathetic position to come from, and they beat the Romans with their brains and their unconventional tactics. I also like that. As a side note, did any of you guys watch the Netflix show Barbarians? Because that's based on this, you know, Arminius is a character, he starts off as a Roman, he quickly becomes disillusioned with the Romans, and then he orchestrates the Battle of Teutoburg. And it was fucking rubbish. Initially, when the marketing came out, I was really excited about this. I heard that the Romans were going to be speaking in period accurate Latin, that they had hired Italian actors to play the Romans to make it extra authentic. And they, I saw the uniforms and the, the look of it, and I thought, wow, this looks really good. And the show was just fucking boring. It was just... <laughs> I remember seeing the first episode and thinking, this is going to be pretty good. Um, but it just wasn't. And what, the bit that really got me was when it got to the Battle of Teutoburg itself. And it was done in kind of slow-mo, and you had all these kind of fight scenes going on in the background, and there was fire everywhere. But it was in this big open plain. And I've always thought, if you were to make a movie about the Battle of Teutoburg Forest, it should be shot like a horror film. You know, dark, there should be a lot of darkness in the forest. There should be tense music. The Germanic tribes, like the monsters in any horror film, should be barely seen. You only see snippets of them until the full battle comes in. You could maybe follow one or two Roman soldiers as they go from thinking something's up to realising there's a problem, trying to figure out how to fix the problem, and then this sense of hopelessness can overcome them as they realise they're trapped deep in enemy territory 
with no hope of escape. It should be kind of like dog soldiers. I don't know if, how many of you would have seen this, but it's a very cheap horror movie made a little while ago about some British soldiers in Scotland who get attacked by werewolves. Not to say that it should be exactly like that, but it should be shot like that. You know, with darkness in the woods, this group of soldiers who die one by one. I, I reckon that would have been better. I didn't even watch the second season. I heard it was rubbish, so I, I figured I wasn't going to put myself through that. I, I, I don't have blood pressure problems yet, but I feel like I would get them from watching the second season of Barbarians. I've gotten sidetracked a little bit here, um, but to the credit of Arminius and the Germanic tribes, this worked. The Romans stayed out of that region of Germania kind of permanently. From there on out, the Rhine River and the Danube River were the borders of the empire. The Romans weren't all that interested in conquering what was on the eastern side of it. But to be fair, the Germans couldn't really punch west either. The Germanic tribes at this point were completely disunited and had no real way of organising themselves as a group. The threat of the Romans coming in and conquering them had convinced them to unite under the leadership of Arminius, but this only worked for a short period of time. As soon as the imminent threat of Roman invasion and occupation was gone away even for a minute, they murdered Arminius and they went back to fighting amongst each other. And as long as this was the case, they would never be able to punch back seriously at the Romans. They might be able to raid across the Rhine occasionally, steal some cattle, you know, raise a village, but they were never going to go and sack Rome. They were never going to permanently dislodge the legions from the Rhine. Not yet, at least. So, for the masterclass that they gave in resisting an imperial power, for incredible guerrilla tactics and, frankly, scaring the shit out of the Romans, the Germanic tribes get B-tier status. Alright, now let's talk about the people who used to live where I now live, the Celtic Britons. Before the Romans got here, the people who used to live in Britain were Celts, much like the people who lived in Gaul and Spain. And the first Roman to pop along was Julius Caesar, who came here as a little bit of a PR stunt. He, he didn't really conquer much. In fact, he didn't conquer anything. Um, he kind of just came over to prove that he could. Britain, to the Romans, was a far away, cold, rainy, misty island, much like it is nowadays. And so Julius Caesar coming here was great fodder for the next election. The Roman who went to that place so far away, we basically consider it the edge of the world. It would be a few generations later, under the reign of the Emperor Claudius, that the Romans attempted to seriously conquer Britain, in like a permanent sense of the word. He came over also as a PR stunt. Claudius was an insecure emperor. He had a stutter, he had never had any military training or career in the military like many emperors before, and people were still alive who remembered the Emperor Augustus. They remembered what a militarily powerful and successful a good politician, a, you know, they, they remembered what a good emperor looked like. Claudius didn't really fit that mould all that well. He was better than Caligula, who came before him, but still no one's first choice for emperor. So to try and get some victory into his credentials, he had Britain invaded. You know, the Romans sent some legions over, and frankly, they conquered the place quite easily. Claudius was so proud of this achievement, and it was his only military victory, he named his only son Britannicus, to remind everyone, you know, that he conquered Britain. Now, the Celtic Britons did put up a fight. Initially, a guy called Caraticus led the Britons against the Romans, and he did a fairly good job for a little while. He, he managed to be a bit of a thorn in their side, but he was eventually betrayed by one of his own and handed over to the Romans to, as a prisoner. Quite a few years later, the most famous of the Celtic Britons, Boudicca, the queen of the Iceni, rose in revolt against the new Roman rule. And she did pretty well. She burnt down Colchester and London, which were the two big Roman population centres at the time. And she ambushed some Roman soldiers and killed them, and that was all well. But there's no getting round the fact that once the Romans even slightly got their shit together and they managed to put together a little army to face against Boudicca, they, they, they smashed the Britons. They really did. I remember when I was in year four, which for those of you not in the UK is about eight years old, I went on a school trip to Maiden Castle, which is this big Celtic hill fort 
that the Britons created to like defend against the Romans. And we got taken round and we were told about a battle that happened there. We got told about the Celts and their slings and their chariots. We got told about the Romans and their tortoise formation, which we all thought was very cool at the time. They even gave everyone in the class a little Roman shield, and we had a go at doing our own tortoise as a little like teamwork exercise. It was a very cool school trip, 10 out of 10, well done, um, whichever member of staff at my primary school organized that one. But the big takeaway is that this was a one-sided fight. The Celts had really good slingers, which, you know, like, good for them. Slings are cool. I don't want to do a disservice to slings. They're very cheap and easy to make. If you get a skilled slinger, they can blast through skulls with those things. Slings are a cool weapon, but you're not winning the war with slings, are you? It's not like the legions popped across to Britain and were like, oh, they've got slings. Oh, shit, everyone back on the boats. We're going back to continental Europe. No one told us we'd have to deal with a guy with a sling. The Britons also used chariots, which are very cool. Don't get me wrong. Awesome. Love a good chariot. You, you, I'm the last person on earth to disparage how cool chariots are. But we're in, we're in CE now. This isn't the second millennium BCE. 2,000 years ago, a chariot is getting you pretty far on the battlefield. In the first century CE, it's like, you know, it'd be like if I rocked up to a modern war wearing a cavalier's outfit. You know, I'd have that silly, like, crossed helmet that they had in the English Civil War and a little cuirass and a little sabre. And I'd say, what ho, fellows, tally-ho, where are the enemy? And it's like, everyone, the enemy's got a javelin missile. The enemy's going to make fucking short work of me. Like, what I'm getting at is that the Celtic Britons, as a fighting force, did a very bad job of resisting the Romans. So the Celtic Britons are E-tier. And frankly, that's generous. You know, the only reason they're not F-tier is because of the Picts. The Romans never got into Scotland, and I count the Picts as being Celtic Britons because, well, they're not going to get their own segment, so we're counting them all together. The Picts are really carrying this team. The Romans tried to get into Scotland. They built a Hadrian's Wall to, you know, stop the Scottish raiders coming down and take their stuff, and Septimius Severus had a crack at conquering Scotland. He couldn't do it. He simply could not subjugate the Picts. So they alone are the reason that the Britons score so highly. Our next group are the Dacians. You might know these guys as the ones that the Romans are fighting on Trajan's column. And that's because Trajan fought the Dacians. They lived in this area here around modern Romania, Hungary, north of the Danube type area. And they get E-tier. And they get E-tier for one particularly good reason. At any other point in Roman history, poking the Romans, provoking them, going to war with them is a risky move. As we've already established, a war with the Romans is a war of annihilation. They very rarely make pieces. So if you're going to go to war with them, you better be sure you're going to win. Where the Dacians fell down is they went to war against prime Rome. The conflict between the Dacians and the Romans took place in the late 1st and early 2nd centuries CE. And the main guy to conquer Dacia was the Emperor Trajan. Trajan is maybe, he's a pretty good contender for the best Roman emperor that ever lived. And he was a military emperor, he was a great general, and he commanded the legions when they were honestly at their best. The Roman legions at this point were a fighting force that no one could stand up against. So the Dacians were picking a bad fight, and they lost, and it's their own fault. Like, to put it this way, the Dacians wanting to fight the Romans was like me wanting to fight Mike Tyson. Already a bad idea, probably not going to win. And then on top of that, they want to fight Mike Tyson in his prime. And when he's on bath salts. And also he's got brass knuckles on. And also I've had both my wrists and legs broken. Like, it's just not going to happen. So the Dacians get E-tier. Nice try, was never going to work. Our next one the Sassanid Persians. So remember how we talked about how the Parthian Empire was the serious eastern rival to the Romans for a few hundred years? And although they started strong by beating the Romans at Carrhae, over time the Parthians got weaker until the Romans could kind of just bully them whenever they wanted. Well, in the early 3rd century, the Parthian Empire crumbled under the weight of its own increasing 
instability and was replaced by the new Sasanian dynasty, a group of local Iranian elites who formed the new Sassanid Empire, which according to them was the rebirth of the old Persian Empire, the mighty Achaemenids whose empire had stretched from India to the Mediterranean. And the Sassanids are basically what the Parthians would have been if they'd ever managed to get their shit together. They were well organised, they were well led, they had cataphracts, which, you know, like... Imagine that coming at you really quick. That would just... I'd go home. Like, I wouldn't be having that. They, like the Parthians, also had guys on horses with bows and arrows, which, as we've established, is about the scariest thing you could see as a Roman legionary. In the mid-3rd century, the Emperor Valerian attempted a big military campaign against the Sassanids and got himself captured. Like, the Roman Emperor was captured in battle, and supposedly, according to one story, the Persian Shah, Shapur, used him as a footstool to mount his horse for the rest of this sad emperor's life. About a hundred years later, another emperor called Julian also attempted to fight the Sassanids. He marched into Mesopotamia with his army, and one day the Sassanids attacked, and he went out to lead his men from the front and encourage them, and an anonymous Sassanid soldier chucked his spear into the emperor, and killed it. And that was the end of that war. For the rest of Rome's lifetime, the true threat, the incredibly dangerous thing that they always had to keep in mind, was the possibility that the Persian Shahs might try and retake their old territories in Syria, Anatolia, and Egypt. And at one point, the Sassanids even manage it, although it's for a very short-lived period of time and beyond the scope of this video. This video doesn't have a scope, I'm making this up as I go along. But I'm definitely not going into Byzantine history. I know some of you have asked for that in other videos. Maybe one day, not today. The Sassanids are S-tier. The S in the tier system actually stands for Sassanid. That's how much they just soar in above all of the other potential enemies of Rome. Our next group is the Goths. The Goths were a tribe of people that originated in Northern Europe, and around the 2nd or 3rd century, they migrated south from probably Scandinavia, although we don't know for sure, and settled in what is today Eastern Europe. The story of the Gothic relationship with the Romans can be divided into two parts. There's like the Phase I Goths, who appeared in the 3rd century and existed until most of the way through the 4th century, and they were basically pirates. They'd get on their horses or their ships, go deep into Roman territory, raid and pillage, grab all the stuff they'd gathered, and go back. The Romans tried to deal with this, but had an honestly quite hard time. Decius, the first Roman emperor to have a crack at the Goths, died at the Battle of Abritus fighting them. But Claudius Gothicus, who came round a bit later, did quite a good job of fighting them. In the mid to late 4th century, thousands of Goths flooded into the empire as refugees. But the Romans didn't handle the migration particularly well, and eventually things turned violent. This resulted in the Gothic War, which peaked with a disastrous battle at Adrianople. At Adrianople, the Eastern Emperor Valens died, along with the rest of his army, fighting the Goths. This was a huge blow to the Romans. They lost a fair portion of their professional legions all in one day. And here's where the Goths are special. They had wiped out a whole Roman army, and then they replaced it. After their war with Rome, the Goths became federates of the Romans. They signed treaties which allowed them to still exist as a people within the empire, and in exchange for being able to live within the empire, they had to fight Rome's enemies for them. This is like trying to get a job you want by killing everyone who currently exists in the role, and then applying for the job and saying, hey, who else is going to do it? So the Phase II Goths are the post-Adrianople ones who exist as federates of the Romans. But it was a tricky relationship. Things didn't always go smoothly. In the year 410, the Goths even managed to sack Rome, which is the first time that Rome had been sacked since the Gauls had done it all the way back in the 4th century BCE. So it's like 800 years of difference between the two. This was a big deal. And the Goths would, in the end, outlast the Western Roman state, setting up successor kingdoms for themselves in Spain, 
southern Gaul, and eventually also in Italy, where they'd clash with the Byzantines occasionally. I personally really like the Goths. I don't know, they, they, they charm me in a way that sometimes an ancient people can charm you. In the same way the Carthaginians charmed me when I first heard of them. So I'm going to stick the Goths in the B tier for the excellent work of destroying Roman armies, becoming the Roman army, and then taking over large portions of the Western Roman Empire when it began to collapse. The next group are similar to the Goths, the Swabes, Vandals and Alans, which was a series of Germanic tribes who in the year 406 or 407, one or the other, crossed the Rhine River and started pillaging Gaul and Spain. Like the Goths, they set themselves up as successors to the Roman Empire. They carved out spheres of influence and kingdoms for themselves, mostly in Spain. Now I've lumped this group together mostly for brevity. I don't have time to go through all of them and I frankly don't really want to. But if this is a group project, it's one of those group projects where two of them kind of do their bit and one totally carries. And that one that carries the whole group is the Vandals. Compared to any other barbarian tribe, the Vandals might have been the most damaging. Vandal, the name of this people, is where we get the word Vandal for like vandalism, destruction of property from. For a couple of reasons. Not only did they sack and burn their way through Gaul and set up a state in Spain, but deciding that that wasn't enough for them, they got on their ships in the 5th century and sailed across to North Africa. North Africa was one of the most important provinces to the empire, especially to the Western Empire. It was incredibly wealthy. Lots of money was to be made in North Africa, and it was the breadbasket of the region. This is where grain grew in abundance enough to feed the parts of the empire that had become net importers of food. So the Vandals popped across and took it, and after they took a bit they'd make a treaty with the Romans, and the Romans, who were very weak at this period, had to agree to let them keep what they took, and then they'd just take more. They'd break the treaty, make a new one, break the treaty, make a new one, taking more and more land until eventually they controlled Sardinia, Corsica, they raided onto Sicily, and all of mainland North Africa. So I'm going to put these guys in the C tier. To be honest, the Vandals are probably B or A tier, but the Swabes and the Alans are like D and F. So they, it evens out at around a C. And our final group, our final enemy of Rome to rank and to give a tier, is the Romans themselves. Which, to be honest with you, was the main enemy of the Romans. I mean, if you joined the Roman legions to be a soldier, there was just as high a chance that you would be battling other Romans as barbarian tribes. The Romans loved a good civil war. They were doing it basically all the time. I mean, from the first century BCE onwards, at the very least. So you start with Marius and Sulla, great big civil war. That was a disaster. You get Caesar and Pompey, Octavian and Mark Antony, uh, what's next? 69 CE, you get the Year of the Four Emperors, a big civil war where four different men declare themselves emperor. Over a hundred years later, you get the Year of the Five Emperors, which was a lot like the Year of the Four Emperors, only there was an extra one. And then half a century after that, the Year of the Six Emperors, which pretty self-explanatory at this point. Then you get the whole third century, which was basically an ongoing Roman civil war with brief periods of peace just so everyone could catch their breath. That ended with Diocletian and the founding of the Tetrarchy, but then you get the Wars of the Tetrarchs after that, which ended with Constantine, but then Constantine's kids all had a war against each other. Then there's the civil war that Theodosius fought. I think he actually fought like two or three of them, in, even in the 5th century. In the 5th century, the Western Roman Empire was collapsing. Barbarian tribes were taking bites out of it. Rome was sacked by the Visigoths. There were a thousand problems to deal with in the 5th century, and yet the Romans kept fighting themselves. Every two years there would be a new civil war. More Romans would die and the empire would get weaker. And to be honest, for perseverance alone, I have to put them in the S tier. I mean, the Romans never managed to beat the Romans, and no matter how many times they were beaten by the Romans, the Romans kept on fighting the Romans. So this is my tier list of Roman enemies. Sorry I missed out the Samnites. I did want to get them in there, but frankly, I, I, I just didn't. I hope you've enjoyed this slightly more informal 
completely unscripted style of video. I've definitely enjoyed doing it. Um, but I've got to stop filming now because it is summer has finally hit the UK and it is hot in here. Feel free to comment any changes that you'd make. Um, you know, you might think that I was particularly unfair on the Gauls. I know a lot of you are going to say I was unfair on the Britons, and I'll be the first to admit that I definitely was. Um, but I'm British myself, so it's a large part of my cultural identity that I have to disparage and degrade the place of my birth. Let me know if you want to see more of this kind of video. And uh, thank you to the patrons, the 14 or so that I've got now. Um, cheers for, you know, supporting the channel and all of that good stuff. Alright, have a good weekend, everybody.